Welcome to the Silver Linings Podcast. I'm here with Adam and our special guest, Tom Evans, also known as Juror Number 18. More on that in uh, in just a little bit. You're here with episode, really is 30 this time. Last time I think I said we're episode 30 and oh. 29, but here we are, episode 30, and it it really is an honor to have you on, Tom, and thank you for doing this. We want to mention from the beginning, and we'll say it again later, Tom is writing about his experience as a juror on the, of course, the Lori Vallow trial. And his book, Money, People, and Sex. Well, Tom, heck, you tell us about your book. <laughs> well, it will be available, et cetera. First of all, it's great to be here with you guys. It's an honor for me. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you. Um, the book is Money, Power, and Sex. The Lori Vallow Daybell trial by juror number eighteen. And well, so is that what being at being at the at the trial and being selected as a juror? Let's go. Let's just start with that. The jury jury selection. I've never been asked to be a juror ever for anything. So what was it? What's the process of first being a juror? Like what 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 went through with that? And how did they take you instead of somebody else? Yeah, I wonder. Well, first of all, um, I didn't know what case I was getting called in for. Huh? I just received the jury notice in the mail. And um, I think the next thing that happened was I got a questionnaire, filled that out. Um, and then finally got called into court, I think a couple of days later. This all kind of happened in one week. Okay. Um, got called into the courtroom. There was uh, hundreds and hundreds of people in this big jury room. And... We, I think the first day, we answered more questions. The jury administrator talked to us a lot. And then we would get called into the courtroom in groups. We were just, we all had numbers. We would line up according to our number and go into the courtroom. And the first time I went into the courtroom, um, I saw Lori sitting there between her two attorneys. Mm. And that's when I knew for sure what the trial was all about. I didn't so know. But you do you heard about Lori's story on the news or whatever before any of this? Like you knew who she was and the case and all that. Was yeah, um, I didn't know details. Okay, I paid attention. I knew who she was. I knew that the kids had been killed. Um, I don't think I knew much beyond that. And then both attorneys get to ask you questions, and then they get to get rid of some people. And you were one that I guess your answers to whatever questions were like, okay, well he's going to be one of the jurors. Yeah, it kind of started with Judge Boyce asking us questions, and, and he would kind of go down the line. And, um, it would, you know, first thing was, is it a hardship for anybody? And he would go down the line, and, um, you know, I was, all I could think about is, how am I going to get out of here, you know? Do you get paid? So do you, if you get selected, the they pay you money to do that because so you, you can't go to your work? Or how does how does that work? I, I, I think it was like $10 a day. Or $10 a day, you're getting paid. It's good money. Your full food. Right, you get free free cookies and a sandwich. Yeah, a lot of snacks. But anyway, he, he would go down the line, and I'm sitting there thinking, okay, what's, what am I going to say? And I remember there was one young lady ahead of me and she was a single mom. She had two jobs. She was going to lose both of her jobs that she had to serve. You know, an extreme hardship for her. And he didn't release her. But he oh. saw he, he might have later. I, I, I oh. He probably did later in private or something. But in the yeah. court, in front of everybody, he wouldn't release her based on that stuff. So when it got to me, I'm semi-retired. This is not a real hardship for me. There were, you know... Yeah. It was springtime. I had plans. I have. That's when I do most of my work outside. Yeah, waiting to be able to do that, and that's what I was going to have to put off. Judge, I have a garden. I need to uh, change yeah. to. I planted some tomatoes, and um, I'm going to have to stick with my tomatoes. I can't deal with this. Uh, oh, really beyond. Yeah. So okay, so you do the whole selection. They choose you as one of the jurors. At that point, um, you um, what? Knowing about Lori was the kids were missing. Like, what did you know before you actually went to drop to trial? Like, did you know? Uh, apparently, did all the jurors know everything? No, I mean, I told you what I knew. I I I knew who she was. Okay. Um, I think I I probably knew who Chad was. Yeah. 
Did you know what? Chad? Well, you, you were, you're from Idaho, so did you know Chad? Be, be was he is he like popular in Idaho with his books and all that, or no? I didn't know anything about his books. I didn't okay. know about him. I just maybe would have recognized him if I had seen him on the news, and that's about okay. Yeah. That is the extent of it. Okay. I I spent a lot of time during the COVID years. Um, we have property up in the mountains, and um, I was up there building my cabin and just kind of away from it all a lot. Oh. Actually, it sounds like a great life. So that was you, don't, you don't have to watch any TV. You don't have to know anything about news. You just like, oh, they're cutting logs and putting stuff yeah, together. Exactly. So, all right, so let's start with this. So you you become a juror with the rest of the group. Um, and then from that point forward, um, was there somebody in the out of the jurors that felt like they would talk more than others? Like, you know, as you guys go and after you hear a piece of something, you guys all meet together and talk about it. Give us that process of, cause I've never been in a juror, uh, jury before. Yeah. Uh, it's pretty awful. We could not talk to each other about the case. Oh, if we, if we even sounded like we might be talking about the case, one of the, uh, bailiffs are, uh, they were kind of always with us. Uh -huh. um, they would say, Oh, be careful, you know, and shut it down. So there was no discussion about the case. So the only thing we do is talk about our families and try to get to know each other a little bit. Wow, that's ah oh, man. Okay, so but, but you guys. So not, again, I've never been a juror before. I've just seen the movie The Juror with Demi Moore. Yeah, right. Um, so do you guys stay in a hotel, everybody, or does everybody go home and come back? How does that? What what happens? Everybody goes home and comes back. Okay, and, but it wasn't really that simple. Um. One of the first instruction we got before the trial started, when, once we had been selected as jurors, was that we had to drive to um, an undisclosed location, which would be changed occasionally. Oh. And then we'd be picked up in vans and driven to the courthouse. And we'd be driven uh, into the back of the courthouse and down into the basement. Um, and we had our two guards that were drivers. And then there would be other guards that met us there in the basement. And then we'd be escorted up the elevator down the hall into the jury room. Was there anybody in uh, Lori and Chad's group that tried to pay you money so you would, you know, get them off, be the one juror to be like, oh, no, she's innocent? I, I think they were, I, I wasn't sure what they were being so careful of because I didn't know the case really well, right? So I didn't mm -hmm. know we were maybe in danger. Right, you're like, what am I getting myself I, into? Something like you just described might happen. Um, I know that we live on a, cul-de-sac there's one way in and one way out it's a really quiet older neighborhood um there's never any place or anything in our neighborhood but um two times my wife and i would go on walks when i'd get home around the neighborhood and two times there were police just slowly cruising up and down our street so i knew that that had to be somehow related i'm thinking now are we in danger i don't know um yeah. but as it went on i realized we're not um they were more concerned about media trying to get a hold of us yeah like of course. It. And it didn't happen. There was one time, not really the media, but maybe like bloggers um, would try to get a hold of jurors. And there was one time when we were in the van after the trial ended for the day on our way home, and um, somebody was following the van. Huh. And uh, so it was kind of funny because our driver, I forget if it was Steve or Ken, uh, Whichever the driver was, he turned the wrong way out on a one-way street, trying to get away. Trying to hit the gas, take yeah. off. I, I, was I was sitting in the back of the van. I'm like, what's going on? What's happening here? Oh, man. And then it pulls over and parks real quick. And, you know, I'm kind of, um, but it was just a blogger trying to chase us down. I guess they'd be trying to follow somebody home, figure out where we were parking or something like that. Okay, so you wrote a book about your experience being a juror in uh, Lori's case. Um, and so we want to get to things that maybe you've said, some cool things in the book that or experiences that you've experienced, or um, also maybe your feelings and thoughts. Rex, I want Rex to talk real quick about when he was in court uh, for the three days he was there and what he experienced. I avoided everything. Like, literally, the only time I saw anything about the court was when Lori uh, said what she said at her last, the last day. That's the only time I tuned in to watch. So I don't know anything about 
anything on uh, with the court. I just couldn't deal with that. But Rex took his daughters. And so, Rex, you go first, and then I want to hear from uh, Tom about his experience, just real quick. Well, uh, the part that pertains directly to the to the jury and what what we wondered there and still wonder even as uh, even after watching you on uh, hidden true crime by the way i recommend his interview on hidden true crime are there any other podcasts you've been on tom yeah I, i've been on uh, three or four others i guess why saying so you google tom on uh or google. tom's like me we have no idea what what interviews we've uh, done what shows we've been on right and so I recommend that. Of course, uh, Lauren and Dr. John always do an excellent job, so we recommend that. But we're really interested in how it affected you and how you heal from that. You had to see things and hear things that people just shouldn't have to hear and see in this life, I think. And we were there for only two of those. And well, we were there three days, and each day had something just dramatic that would rip our arts out yeah you know one of the days summer was there adam's sister and yeah. you remember listen summer listening to that and then she was examined and cross-examined after that i don't know where she got the strength to do that she, i thought she was tremendous but it was hard to read it was hard. it was hard to watch some of those people and we were there when uh they went into great detail something i had avoided the whole time and that is finding out how the children died. Well, couldn't hide there. <laughs> they went into, well, you know how much detail. And then the autopsy photos were my third day there. Mm. And I tried. Um, I knew it was my job to look at those. But I told myself, I knew what was coming. And I told myself, I'm going to just take the quickest possible glance and look away. And those images are in my mind. doesn't matter. You could... I could see every little bit of that still to this day. I think I always will. Do they tell you as a juror, like, not to cry or not to show emotion or, I mean, or to control yourself while you're in the court or anything like that? No. Uh, what they did do was they handed us barf bags and Kleenex on the way in. Wow. So I knew something bad was coming. Yeah. Yeah, that was... That's a lot to take in. Yeah. It was so heavy that... Uh, they turned the screen so only the jury and the teams and the judge could see the autopsy photos. We at the gallery couldn't see them. Judge Boyce was nice enough. There, Myself and the three daughters, he said, I know we have family here. That was us. If you want to see those photos, you can come up afterwards and we'll make arrangements, show them to the family. Well, I didn't do it and one of my daughters didn't to my Big surprise, one of my daughters wanted to see him and her sister went with her to support her. I didn't, I didn't want to see him. And then I went to the sentencing or the clothing arguments and saw him anyway. But um, how, uh, I, you probably can't speak for other jurors on this and don't have to, but Tom, how do you deal with something like that? How do you, how do you process that and move on? Well, and that's the thing. You think you're going to go serve your time, and then you're going to go back your life, right? And it was not that way for me. And I think it was for some jurors. I think uh, I know of a few jurors that are still struggling, so I, I think it's harder on some people than it is on others. Um, but could I just um, kind of go back and describe? It was kind of a transformative thing for me, and it was totally unexpected. Only there, please. So... Going into this, um, you know, it was dark, it was depressing, um, all the bad emotions and feelings that you can have. And it was just, I'm going to do a good job of this, and it's going to be hard, but I'm going to do it. Um, but over time, sitting in that courtroom, things transformed for me, and it turned into something I wasn't expecting. It was, it went from... Um, that darkness that I talked about and it turned into there were so many good people involved and it turned more into um, being proud of them and also being proud of the court system and well the justice system and you know we've gone through so much over the last few years in this country right and it's it's always all bad news 
And I got to sit there and see things work in a way that um, I wasn't expecting. And I, it was uh, uplifting to me to see. I, I saw, like you mentioned, uh, Detective Permacio. I saw him do a great job and so many others uh, presenting um, the information in a professional way. It was hard. I know it has to be extremely hard for for those people. You know, I saw the family members go through what they had to do testifying in court, and it really turned things over for me, and it, it made me proud of, of the whole thing. And so that's kind of why I decided that I was going to write the book, and um, it, it, it couldn't, I couldn't walk out when it was over and have it be over for me. I knew that. And also, I wanted to write about the good things that I saw happen there. There was, there was Lori... And then there was um, a courtroom full of people that were good people doing the right thing. At the, be- at the beginning, though, wasn't Chad, before Chad got arrested, didn't Lori go, was it Chad at Lori's uh, pre- uh, hearings, like before there was a, that? You weren't part of that, though, were you? I part of that, but looking back on it, yeah, I see that all the time. Was Chad true. was actually there, and when you're in a, when you're uh, in the jury, and you know all these you know people are testifying and stuff. Do you pay attention to what everything they're saying, or do you glance over and see Lori? Because a lot of people are saying they're watching Lori's face, they're watching her reaction. You know, she's acting, you know, smiling and acting like you know crazy, and has orange lipstick on, and like all the all the things that it's distracting. I don't know, did that distract some of the jurors or not? I don't know. Uh, number one priority for me was to try to comprehend. You know, first of all, it was it was really confusing you know the, the trial just started right i mean we did our jury selection all that and it seemed like just all of a sudden there i was and and lindsey blake was giving her or opening arguments and the trial was on and so i felt like i was kind of riding the curve the whole time trying to understand so my first priority was to understand what the witnesses were saying and try to grasp you know what direction the prosecution was trying to go in and then when when the defense um, would talk to the um, the witnesses, try to understand what they were doing, but there were a lot of times when I would look over at Lori and try to see what her reaction was. So that was priority number two for me. I think is what's Lori up to? How is she reacting to this? Yeah, so, yeah. I did look did, that. Did anything surprise you from what the looks that you got from Lori, or were they all pretty consistent? It was pretty consistent most of the time, I would say. I I saw a lot of her, she was kind of looking away with her hair down, um, you know, when there was something that I guess she didn't want to listen to or whatever she would do. Yeah. That. It was hard when Summer, Colby, when different people testified. I forget there was one witness who I think was a friend who Lori was just staring da- daggers at. She was- Audrey. Audrey, yeah, that's who it was. Audrey, yes, he's staring her down. Oh, so Lori stared her down, but when Summer and Colby were up on the stage, did Lori look at them at all, or she oh, looked away? So. Yeah, I, you know, I was spending more time listening to the witnesses because they were, that was really hard to listen to. And yeah. And more my attention than Lori. But uh, yeah, I need mean, it all. Let me take another side trip there. Did you find Audrey's testimony credible? You know, I was, it was kind of an exciting moment for me in a way when, um, I guess it was John Thomas got up or maybe it was, no, it was Archibald, uh, who, who got up and cross-examined her and asked if, you know, she made all this BS last BS up or whatever it was he said, like, oh, you know, they're putting up a defense, a little bit of fireworks here, but, um, I didn't, I, I didn't know what to think. It, it did, when he did cross-examine her, I do have to say, it felt, oh, it maybe woke me up a little bit to, okay, I, I can't just believe everything she's saying. Maybe there's another side of this story. Because it was pretty wild. <laughs> it was, and if you don't mind me sharing what it did for me, that is the first time, you know, I, I've known Lori since the day, known and loved Lori since the day she was born. And that was the first glimpse into the character that I call Psycho Lori. <laughs> and I found that not only credible, because I knew to perpetrate this evil that she had perpetrated, 
that needed to happen. She needed to be a different person than the person I knew. And Audrey's description fit that. And I thought, there it is. Okay. That is even terrifying. Terrifying. Yeah. terrifying is a great word. There's a picture of Psycho Lori that could get herself into that mindset to right. do. She did. Yeah. What about uh, Melanie Gibb? Did uh, anybody, any jurors that you got to talk to, or or did anybody find her credible, or did people f think that she was lying about certain things? I've heard a lot of things uh, about that. I think after the fact, you know, we did talk. Once it was over, we got to talk about it. And then I've met with a few of the jurors, and we've discussed things since the trial ended. But uh, I think people have a lot of questions about Melody Gibb. Yeah. How, how involved was she? Did she right. know maybe what was going on? Did, did, just... Zoo, did Zoo Limit testify or no? Yeah, she did. Zoo Limit did testify? She, she was on the stand for quite a while. Did the uh, the jur did the uh, the uh, attorneys ask her about her you know being in charge of weather and stuff like all the things that Chad said she was in charge of? Yeah, it, it didn't get too weird. I don't remember okay. the uh, defense cross examining her a lot. Okay, but uh, you know her whole demeanor, everything about her was a little bit strange to me. Yeah. Okay. So we're all in the same boat, finding that there's some strange things, and some people yeah. may were not telling the whole story, or right. you know, I definitely uh, had the feeling that Zulema was not telling the whole story. Yeah, definitely. Okay. So we're all on that same page. Yeah. Um. So tell us a little bit more about what kind of things did you put in your book about being juror number eighteen uh, at the trial? Like, if somebody was to buy your book, they're like, "Oh, I'll find." I get to read something that I don't know already or something on the inside that maybe that you talked about. Um, I, I talked some about being a juror. I mean, that's kind of what it's about. Yeah. I kind of dive off into other things at the same time. Um, <clears throat> I got into a little bit about cults and I tried to, and, and I'm not, um, I don't know a lot about the Mormon religion. Mm -hmm. I've learned a lot. Yeah. But uh, I tried to understand what the connection might be there with um, the Mormon church and the offshoots and preppers and all this kind of stuff. Yeah. So I dive into that a little bit. Um, I, I go off into other cults that don't have anything to do with the Mormon church, just because it's kind of fun. Yeah. Might help. Do you, do you, Rex and I uh, have talked to some people that we want to get on our podcast, but they, they have decided yet not to come on yet. But we had had a conversation off the grid and off the air with them. And, um, you know, cult is a thing that Rex and I both are kind of like throwing back and forth about with Chad and Lori's group. Was it a cult group that was a group? Like, it wasn't just Chad and Lori. It was there, and besides Alex, you know, being their hitman killer or whatever, um, there's other people and who was involved and how do cults work and how to, was it, was there more than three people there for the kids being killed? Like we have a lot of, Rex and I have a lot of uh, questions about all that. Did any of that pop into your head? Did you hear anything in trial where you were just like, oh, that's odd or strange or that could fit into that category? Yeah, um, that part of it is so interesting to me, and I wish I had more information. I wish I could find out more. People don't want to talk, obviously. Um, yeah. I wish I could talk to Chad and Lori, honestly. I, if, if they were, I actually put an application in for an interview with her, knowing I had to try, but I, I knew she wouldn't. Oh, you can put it. So people ask me all the time, are you going to talk to Lori? And I was like, I have no idea what's going to happen with that. But you have to put in an application to talk to her, and she says either yes or no? I guess so. I never got a response, so I'm assuming that she said no. Uh, I wonder if she would respond to me, or would she just ignore me too? Uh, yeah, I wonder. Um, you have to put in an application to the prison, and then I guess if she The won't. president talks to her and says, hey, so-and-so wants to talk to you. Yeah, I don't know what happens on that end, but I'm assuming something like that. Mm. She apparently said no, and they just threw it in the trash, I guess. Yeah. Um, and she wouldn't answer my questions, even if I were. No, she's never, I don't think she's ever going to answer, answer anybody's questions. I, I wish one of the Melanie's or Zulema or somebody like that would just come clean 
that tell us about all of that. They could tell us about if it was a cult or what was really going on. Well, Rex and I talk about this all the time. Alex was somebody who just tells the truth, no matter what it is. Really? And so if, if he was still alive, we would know everything about Chad and Lori's plan and everything. Right. Even though he was involved in it, he got duped and all the things that went on with that, he would tell all that. And so Rex and I have mentioned that on other podcasts that for sure, Rex and I both believe with 100% that Al would tell everything. So what do you think? Is that why he's dead? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I, I My thing is he he either realized that, you know, he was getting used and killed himself, or I think somebody poisoned him and somebody was ordered to poison him. That's yeah. that's my theory. That's in I, I'm I, I've been right about everything on this case with my gut feeling. It just all fits to what I have thought. And yeah. just uh, it goes down the pattern of what's common sense of why they would do this at this time and all that. Yeah. yeah. What about uh, Joe Ryan? Joe, I'm fifty fifty on. Um, I think that either Lori and Alex somehow got into his apartment and did something to him to kill him, or he really did die of a of a heart attack in his in his uh, thing. And um, but no matter what happened, either way. I feel like Lori and Al, or at least Lori felt like, oh, you know, God allowed me to do that if I killed him, or God listened to my prayer and killed him because I've been praying for him to be dead after he molested my kids. So there's, no matter what happened, I think Joe being dead was the start of Lori being like, oh, this is something that I think, you know, I'm I'm in charge. I, I have power now from heaven right. kind of thing. Either, yeah. either, either they were allowed, like God let them in Joe's apartment and killed them or whatever, or Joe died naturally and they, she and God answered her prayer. At some point, that put her on a pedestal of, of spirituality and, and upper shalant of. In my mind, that's what that's how I feel like she she took that. I I think so too. And at the very least, it made her realize that well, somebody dying solves a lot of problems for me. Right. Yeah. 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 Well, we've we've started down. I've written down three paths I want to get back to. <laughs> I know. Sorry, never come back. Um, well, it's all it's all good. It's all interesting, Tom, and your insights so valuable. Um, at first, first, um, can I go back to where we we're talking about how y'all cope, how the jurors cope, and I believe they offered you some assistance afterwards, but. Do you know of people that took him up on that, or people getting help with counseling, or people yeah. on their own? How do you how do you deal with stuff like that? Yeah, um, they offered to pay for counseling if anybody needed it, and I know there's a couple two two that I know of that are doing that. Um, I hope it's helping with them. For for myself, I think talking to you guys, writing the book, uh, getting involved in this through kind community, all this kind of stuff has been uh, helpful for me and also dwelling on the good, not the bad so much. That's helped me. I think he's with us on that. Well, Rex has four therapists, but you and I, Tom, haven't gone yet. So Rex has taken all the therapists for both of us. You can have, you can have one of mine. It's, you know, we can borrow. We can, if you need one, just borrow one of Rex's. Hey, when you're more messed up, it takes more people to, to help you. Yeah. And I, still, I, still, I still think about it once in a while. I think, you know, maybe I'll go down that road. Me too. Yeah. 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 Oh, yeah. And we've talked, we've talked on the show before. It's all, we think it's all about who your therapist is and your connection with a therapist, not necessarily their experience, their education, but, you know, right. you get a connection where, where it'll help you and they can, they can help you. We don't know how all that works. I think that's what I'm afraid of is I'll go to a therapist and it'll be, you know, my worst nightmare, worst case yeah. scenario. Yep. I get that. I I certainly get that. Um, I think you mentioned on the the interview with Lauren and Tom that your wife noticed you change, or a change in you. Am I am I misstating that or mis? Yeah, I think she did say that. Mm -hmm. um, I don't remember the exact conversation, but I think she thinks that I something changed in me. Yeah. So, yeah. 
I know, I know when changes happened in me because it was like a shift inside of me. I don't know what those changes are. <laughs> we have time seeing therapists, but you know, my I mentioned my wife and I had had purposely avoided finding out how the children died or finding out anything about that. Yeah, I found that out in the courtroom. That was a shift, and we had in our mind, you know, our own story that well they drugged the kids, the kids were passed out, then they did what they did. That's not what the evidence said in there. And that just knocked me for a loop. And uh, that that has taken a lot just to deal with that. And so I'm I'm imagining 18 people, strangers to each other, coming together, having to upend their life for two months find out all these, and these are people that are professional in the psychology world. These are data people, you and 17 others, and you have to hear and see all of this. And okay, now you're back out there in the world. I I, I don't know how. I don't know how. I'm grateful. Why I got, you can do uh, yeah, I got to talk to Lauren and John. I got to ask, well, we got to talking about I was going down the same road that you just described. I was thinking they had to had to have been drugged, and I was wanting to believe that. Me too. Uh, and I and I, I actually came up with some evidence that kind of made me think that that's what happened. But when I was talking to Lauren and John, it was a live stream, and Kay was listening, and she messaged, "No, that's not what happened. They were not drugged." Right. Um, so she must know. Uh, so yeah, I kind of given up on that idea. It's it's a nice thought. Yeah, it it was somehow on some level as comforting. The evil is just as evil, but um, and but it didn't happen. So that was that was a shift. Um, and I'm sure you have to deal with a lot of them for a long time. So uh, yeah. thanks for doing that. There's just I know you didn't choose to, didn't want to, but. Uh, well, thank you. But I have to say my small part, you know, I was so far removed from it, from everybody else in that courtroom. It was pretty easy for me to just sit there and say, I'm, I'm okay. You know, yeah. this is the feelings I'm having here are nothing compared to, you know, the people who had to exhume the bodies and deal with all that stuff. Yeah. Yeah. No kidding. You know, the, their, their profession. You and, I, you and I see that so much alike. You're just grateful for everyone doing that yeah absolutely so you got to get you another pathway we started to go down you said afterwards as jurors got to talk what was tell us about that what did you talk about and what you know you now you, the damn burst okay we can talk about it oh right yeah. so the way this went down um uh so the last day um the judge gives his jury instructions and we knew that there were six alternates but we didn't know who the alternates were going to be right? until the last day. And so he gives the jury instructions, and all of a sudden, before I even knew what was going on, the clerk is pulling numbers out of a hat. And I think it was the first number was my juror number 18. And so I was excused. And at that point, I did, you know, I was waiting for my number to be called the whole time going into this, hoping that I would get out of jury duty, right? Yeah. Not, not want my number called because I had so much invested. I and I wanted to be in that room deliberating and making sure that my voice was heard. And I had that opportunity. You know, I was like insulted and hurt when that happened. And I had to just tell myself, you know, I don't matter. This is the process. Mm -hmm. the yeah, you so you did you did your part of whatever, you know, unfortunately you didn't get the the, the result right. that you wanted. But anyway, so as soon as that happened, we were released. And so those of us that were released were like, well, let's go get a drink and we can talk. So that's what we did. We went and you know, walked down to a bar, sat there, had a drink or two, and discussed the case. And that was so, so cool to be able to do that because I don't know. I, I have my opinions about what I'm hearing. Somebody else has theirs. You don't know what those are. You, I don't know if I'm the only one thinking these things. Right. 
you know, so getting to talk to the other jurors was great. Was, yeah. Did you feel when you were at the bar talking to the other uh, jurors, um, did you feel like you all had something in common, at least of what you or was, was everybody like at a different, well, I think this happened or I think this happened or 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 were you all pretty, pretty similar? Pretty similar, pretty much on the same page. Uh, we all had our, our own insights, I guess, and maybe some different ideas, but 99% on the same page. Yeah. I don't think there was any disagreement about guilty or not guilty at all. Yeah. And Lori's defense, really, the, the attorneys really didn't have anything to go with. Lori didn't want to give them anything or tell them or help them with anything. Right. Um, I From think... Perspective, yeah, God. words I ever heard were when uh, Jim Archibald stood up, and I forget his exact word, but he basically said, we don't feel... The prosecution proved their case, so the defense rests. Yeah. You know, I thought that we were going to be going into the next phase of the trial, where they would get their opportunity, and there would be a couple of weeks of that at least. Yeah. And all of a sudden, nothing. Yeah, I don't think Lori, you know, she wanted to do that. I feel like she feels like, you know, I'm, you know, I'm going to let things happen the way you know God wants them to happen. I think she's in that mind frame. Yeah. I, I may be wrong, but that's that's what that's how I feel that she's at. Yeah, I got to talk for hours to the whole prosecution team, and that was that was really interesting. And I was so appreciative of them to spend that time with me. Yeah. Um, the defense would not talk to me. The only thing that um, Archibald said was, you know, we really didn't get to. Um, uh, proceed with the case the way they would have liked to because they couldn't use insanity as a defense. No. Beyond that, he wouldn't talk to me, which I respect that. I don't worry that he wouldn't have any reason to talk to me. Yeah. So, Tom, can you share any takeaways from your um, conversations with the prosecution? Like, top top couple takeaways from that, or is that privileged information? Or um, what do you want to talk about? It's not really privileged information. It was just great to be able to. I was so impressed. This happened right after the sentencing, and I'd been talking to Lindsay Blake, texting back and forth, and um, she was willing to meet me, which I thought, wow, this is great. So I drove uh, from Rexburg to, I went to, I think, the Fremont County Courthouse because she said our office is right by the courthouse, you can visit, and I couldn't find it. And then um, so I called her up and, oh, no, we're at the, I forget it was Madison County Courthouse. Or they were in, in Rexburg. I don't remember. Yeah, I was in Rexburg anyway. So I had to drive all the way back there. But when I walked into the room, they're all sitting there. Yes. Yeah. The whole team. And, you know, I thought, well, you know, this will probably last a couple of minutes. You know, but I had a whole list of questions for them. But they all sat there for like two hours. And again, I finally had to end it thinking, you guys have to have better things to do than sit here talking. <laughs> and, but they answered all my questions. Um, I don't know if there was any real takeaways from that other than my appreciation of them. Like they answered a lot of questions, but I can't think of anything off the top of my head that really stood out. No, I appreciate them, but probably like you, I appreciate the defense team too. They have a role to do, a job to do. They're right. Lauren gave them nothing. They had nothing to work with, and that's why you stood up there and said, we don't you know, what, what else can he say other than yeah. we don't think they proved their case? Because the only other thing to say is, I got nothing. <laughs> and so, I don't. I, I felt for those guys. And I know, you know, they they have a job to do. That's part of the legal process. And I think they did what they needed to do. I think they did their jobs. They they gave her due process, mm -hmm. which is what she's allowed. And yeah. I, they, they got the death penalty off the table. Well, Tom, let me get get back to uh, a third road we started to go down when we started talking about Colts. And Adam mentioned that he and I believe, and I'm going to say it differently, I think there's a, a better than even chance that the murders were ritualistic. Have you run across any evidence or anyone else on that path or of that belief? Hmm. How do you mean ritualistic? Meaning there was some type of cult or organization involved and the murders were done and more witnesses 
than the people that actually committed the murders. Wow. Yeah. I wonder. I don't know. Um, I know, you know, binding was a thing. Burning was a thing. Um, but beyond that, I don't. I would love to know. Were there other people involved? Were there other people there? Yeah, that's a tough road. Um, we're going to do more exploring. There's more behind the scenes that we're going to do with that and try to find out more about Alex, just, uh, just what happened. Um, while you have this chance, do you have any other questions about Alex? We both uh, were pretty close to him. Any, any questions remain um, unresolved? Um, I've learned quite a bit about Alex, but really... Um... You mentioned, you talked a little bit about his relationship with Lori. Mm -hmm. I guess I'd like to hear more because I've, I've read that, you know, there was like some touching and stuff going on that seemed weird to people um, outside. Yeah. Of me. And that and that's no, um, our stance on that is no secret. We made a response out. We've talked about it in our podcast. I know people um, jumped on that because of what uh, Alex's wife of, how long were they married, Adam? Three months or? Yeah, six weeks, I think. They got annulled. As weeks and more than months. And uh, yeah. So he, he was married to Zalema and that got annulled? Is that what you're talking about? No, the the Debbie, or what, I think her name's Deb. Deb or Debbie. Oh, yeah. She, they were married and she went on the thing and said, Lori and Alex were inappropriate and all that stuff. And he was like, that. he yeah. saw inappropriate behavior. And, yeah. and I hung out at that house a lot and yeah, I saw lots of it, stuff that outside people outside the family would call inappropriate. I never saw that. But I not only did I never see anything, and Adam, I'll give you a shot. Adam's talked about it before, too. Um, I didn't see anything inappropriate. When I didn't see any indication that there is much of a relationship at all. If you remember, um, Lori didn't have a really much of a relationship at all with Alex until he converted over to their, you know, religious rabbit hole. Okay. Now, here's here's what I think is more compelling than the fact I didn't see anything. In that family, being an outsider but being close to the family, so to speak, I knew, every, I not, knew all indiscretions. I knew everything because they talk in that family. <laughs> especially Alex and Janice have someone did something they don't hide it Adam mentioned Alex is you know he'll tell the truth about anything literally anything anyone's indiscretions in the family it's part of his comedy routine mm -hmm. so the fact that I didn't hear anything even close to resembling that makes me doubt it now in this case um, the one phrase that Adam and I lean on a lot is nothing would completely surprise me. You know, if it did happen, it did, but I certainly would not take that one person saying she saw an inappropriate simulated act as being, oh, they were having sex. I, I do not see any way to get from a that A to that B. Okay. Yeah, no, same same thing. Alex is like a comedian and he did a lot of inappropriate, you know, behavior things because he is a comedian. And so it just, I'm sure on one occasion he was doing something and Lori was there and, you know, Lori liked to show off or Lori liked to be in the center of attention. So for like three seconds or five seconds, they probably did something that would look like it's inappropriate, but in, they're both joking around and Al's a comedian. I'm sure it got blown out of proportion with that. Um, so, and that's, that's the problem with some of these things and things that you hear from other people. It's like, oh, this happened and this, they're probably doing this and this and they don't understand. Uh, you know, our family, we joked around about a lot of things. Um, well, hearing that made me, made me wonder and think about that and kind of go down that road like okay how weird was this family was there all this stuff going on yeah. but that was the only indication that i had was from her yeah saying that yeah and who knows if she wanted her 15 minutes of fame or you know why did why didn't she report that um when they got divorced or the things that she said why why wait till just now to to bring those things up? It doesn't make any. If it doesn't make sense to me, and it, and it, and obviously 
um, you know, people try to, we're trying to get limelight for some reason on this. Um, that's, that's what it was for me to watch or hearing that I was like, oh gosh, there's some that's blown out way out of proportion. Well, and the, then, so the same thing with your father, right? I mean, I've heard some things, um, but in, in, um, eating deeper, I don't really find that much. What was he like? Oh, my dad, um, well, my dad's, he doesn't like getting in the limelight either. Um, and, uh, but you know, again, his timing was way off on everything. His timing was the worst. He threw away our Christmas tree on Christmas Eve. Um, uh, like I, I had a plan to go to a football game. I've been waiting for three weeks to go to our Eisenhower versus Fontana football game. And that Friday night, he decides to take our family to go see a movie called the gods must be crazy where nobody spoke English in it. And I'm 17 years old dying to go to the playoff game, a football game. I'm waiting for three weeks. And he goes, no, we're all going like the timing for me, for him. He just didn't have any timing and he did things his way. Um, and he grew up with his dad, who was a hard worker. So my dad grew up at five years old, you know, with a shovel in his hand. So every Saturday morning, we would all work like crazy. Um, and just, it was one of those things. Um, so I don't know. It, uh, there's a lot of things. And he doesn't really like getting involved with in this case, too. Um, so, you know, I'm just not sure about a lot of things with, with, you know what he wants to talk about or not talk about or uh, i don't know it's, it's yeah, okay. okay yeah and that i'll i'll say tom the question you didn't ask directly i believe Lori was abused in her life not i don't know by whom i have no evidence i don't know i don't know that there's anyone in the family but i believe she was abused she certainly has the characteristics of someone that was I'm yeah. pretty sure about at least one teacher at her school that I knew of that got arrested for abusing girls at the school. I know, I I I believe he abused her also. So I think there is abuse in her past. I don't tie that to any. I don't have any ties of that to any family member. Okay, that's good to hear. Yeah, and they, and again. Under the caveat of, we don't know. You know, we're talking about things that'll probably never be proven, and and uh, we could be wrong on on any of this. We certainly would have been wrong about, you know, if someone asked us up until up until the children went missing. Before that, if someone asked us if Lori would kill her children and put them in Chad's backyard, you know, yeah, of course. yeah. yeah. No matter how wacky or how weird her religious beliefs, we we certainly wouldn't have would certainly wouldn't have called that one. But both yeah. Adam and I, when we heard the children were missing, both of us felt that the grief she killed them. Yeah, you both felt what that she well, when they when uh, Nate Eaton was following her in Hawaii, saying, "Lori, where are the kids?" and she wouldn't tell him where the kids were. That's because you won't tell them because they're dead. There's nowhere to tell them that. You know, for her to act the way she was acting and and not saying where the kids were, my I I knew they were dead, and I couldn't really prove it or say anything to anybody. But my, my heart was just torn up because everybody else in the family apparently they weren't talking to me at that time, but. Apparently, they thought Lori, Lori told them, or if, if they even got a chance to talk to Lori, I think somebody said that they were hiding in some bunker somewhere in Hawaii with a friend, hiding from uh, Kay and Larry's uh, brother-in-laws or what, whatever the stupid excuse was. Um, and they, they, they bought into that. Now, I was 99.9% .9 sure the kids were dead, but I did hold on to one-tenth of 1% 1 that please let these kids be in a bunker somewhere in uh, somebody's. And I had that hope, but yeah. I pretty much knew that if she's not producing kids, that means there's no kids to produce. At some point, you know, the emotional part kind of gets overwhelmed by this reality. And, you know, it seems pretty obvious. Yeah. Pretty unlikely that the kids were alive. And then again, I don't know the timeline on this, but I did hear that when Lori met Chad's parents and they asked Lori if she had kids and she said that her daughter Tylee had passed away 
um, that threw a, a lot of red flags yeah. up. Yeah. But I can't remember how far after that was or before that or what. my time. My timeline is is so messed up because you know it's all you know all together for me. But at that point, you knew she was lying. Oh yeah, yeah. So what? Um, when you got the letter from Charles, that was to you, right? Yeah. Um, what letter was that? The one where he was telling that Lord that uh, dark scales that he had different people that were dark. Yeah. 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 Several family members got that. I I received. Oh. That. Is that from Charles? Yeah, from Charles. I don't know, Adam. You never said that you got that. I don't know that you did receive that. I got a cramp in my hamstring. Hang on a second. Oh, oh that's a convenient cramp. Oh, oh it hurts. It hurts. I guess. <laughs> Ow. Ow. Sorry. You must have touched a nerve there, Tom. <laughs> or a uh, or hamstring or something. I hate cramps. I the workout. Sorry, I didn't know. Um, I haven't gotten my cold plunge yet. So <laughs> that's lovely. Um, go back. So yeah, I don't know if I ever saw that. The the letter that I got from Charles was he was telling me about Lori sent Chad's wife a letter saying that. Charles wanted Chad to write a book for him about his yeah, baseball right. career. That's what I that's what I remember. That's the that's the letter that I got. And I was like, a little the... further down the line time wise. Okay. Is that the one you're referring to, Tom? Yeah, that's what I was referring to because I was just wondering about Charles and uh, and Charles was in a panic. He he called me in panic every day. He called me in a panic. Really? And most of the days he was crying. Um, because it was just like unbelievable what he had to go through with Lori and listening to what she's saying and trying to figure out how to get her help. Um, and they just had a great life together and, and everything was good all the way up until it wasn't, right? Yeah, you're right. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And so that's why I talk about when people say, you know, Lori was this monster the whole time. And it's like, it's just not, it, that's not the way it was. It just, it just didn't happen like that. She gradually, she gradually went on from, you know, going from near death experiences, this book to Julie Rowe to chat. It went down a whole other, a, a rabbit hole. But before that, yeah, it wasn't like that. Yeah, the know is when it started in our mind. We don't know, but yeah, there's obviously a progression. Yeah, the the more people I talked to that were close to her, um, the more I believe that that's absolutely the truth. Is that she was what she claimed to be up until that time, whether it was 2018 or whenever it started to change for her. Yeah. You know, when she met Chad, for sure. But it seemed like maybe a little before that, she had started to yep. do some weird things. And, yeah. And I wish I knew more about the Prepper group and all these other players like the Melanies and Lemma and what was really going on with all of that, and, you know, was Chad trying to be a polygamist or was he kind of going down that road? Yeah, that's weird. Um, or is there a group called AVAL? Yeah. Is, that the, is that the group, Rex, or is that a different group? I can't remember. That, yeah, that's a group. I don't I don't associate Chad. Then with Chad and Lori with them? Part of it. Okay. And so their followers were all a part of it, but I didn't paint. The pe the other people that were in vow uh, in a vow with the same brush, right? They were following Chad. You know that whole Chad's whole group was in there, but a vow can go on doing what they're doing without Chad and still not be doing the evil crap that Chad and Lori were doing. Well, I think. Well, go ahead. I was going to say I think they're more of a legitimate, uh, not really so much of, you know. A prepper group, I guess they are. You know, they're yeah. able to be prepared. A legitimate French group. <laughs> a legitimate yeah, more legitimate, I guess. I don't know. Yeah, but I feel like there's preppers who just prep for emergencies, and if there is some kind of crazy thing that happens, that they're ready. I think there's a, you know, some people say, "Oh, preppers are all crazy." I don't know if preppers are crazy. I feel like you know they're prepared for anything that could happen, or, or, or earthquake, or you know, any weird thing that could happen that okay. they're prepared. Yeah, yeah, no. And so when I'm talking about preppers, I'm thinking more of the uh, out on the edge kind of a little bit. Yeah. Pairing of people type. Yeah. Prepper groups yeah. Yep. And wondering what goes on with, with them and what do you kind of want to go back 
to the Mormon fundamentalism and, um, you know, polygamy and all those kind of things. And I'm just wondering if that was part of their thing or not. Yeah. Um, I'll tell you what, what my perspective, we've talked about this before, my perspective is, um, they chose evil. What they did was just evil. And like all of us, when we do something wrong, like we speed in the car, we eat something we aren't supposed to, we drink something. I was in eating some mint Oreo stuff a little while ago that I probably shouldn't have been been eating. We tell ourselves a little story. Well, this is okay. I worked out this morning. This is okay. I'm, you know, I'm right. in this meeting. We tell ourselves a little story, okay? Now, the further away we get from doing what our conscience tells us is we should be doing, the further away you get, the bigger those story goes. Lori kept going with, that was evil. To tell those stories, we draw on anything we can. For Chad and Lori, religion and um, the book and all of that, fair game. So they took, I know Chad took a lot from Dungeons and Dragons and from... Harry Potter. Harry Potter, okay? Whatever they had available to tell their story to justify their evil, they took advantage of, including. Okay, so evil people are going to do evil and justify it however, however they can. Yeah. I shouldn't say they. I should say we. It's just a matter of degrees, isn't it? Right. Yeah, <laughs> that's just to an extreme degree. Yeah, that's all. Um, I, they must. There must have been paths to choose along the way that for both Chad and Lori that they chose to go down this path and that path and that ended up hundreds maybe thousands yeah like yeah. all of us and we just let our conscience stop us at some point where they didn't well we know it's our conscience when we hear a voice in our head right for Lori and Chad it seems like for them that that was the voice of God or you know um, an ancestor or somebody speaking to them through the through the bail or the portal or whatever. Mm -hmm. You know, I hear voices in my head all the time, but I don't think it's anybody special talking to me. It would be nice, but yeah, I don't think I'm special because they're right. exactly. And I think that's the difference. They they felt like they were special enough that somebody he, asked. He goes a part of all of us that just let theirs go unchecked. Okay, okay. going us. We let our conscience check our ego to some degree. They did not. Knowing them firsthand, were they like super egotistical people? I didn't, we don't know Chad at all, but Lori, yeah, I'd say Lori um, probably enjoyed um, her ego more than, probably checked her ego less than a lot of us. You see that in the, pageants she did and what she said on game shows on TV that you've seen, I'm sure. Well, I watched all that. Yeah. Yeah. So at one point I had, I hope, a whole lot bigger ego than I have now. In other words, I hope I've been able to check that. You know, I had, I had an ego and, and it wasn't easy, you know, checking that. Okay. You have to do a lot of internal work and listen to your conscience, which hardly anyone wants to do you know but uh yeah i think i think that's characteristic of people that turn out to have a messiah complex of course that's all ego yeah yeah well, that's still... well tom have we exhausted your questions <laughs> <laughs> uh, i probably could come up with a billion of them I don't uh, honestly though coming into this i thought it would be going the other way more i I should have thought maybe a little bit more ahead of time. Well, maybe we can do a part two. If you come up with a bunch of questions you want to ask us, we can do a whole nother podcast and call it part Tom part two. Yeah. If you guys would be willing to do that, I would love that. Oh, yeah. Yeah, of course, we'd be willing. Or if you want to talk offline, you know, and then see if you have a different answer from us offline. We don't think you will, but, you know, you can, you can see that too. But we certainly appreciate you being here and talking and, uh, and being a member of the jury, you know, a group that I just have so much gratitude for. Thanks for doing doing what you did and having to deal with stuff that people shouldn't have to deal with. Yeah. It turned out to be my honor to do that. And I really appreciate you guys and what you guys are doing. I think it helps a lot. Yeah.
And good luck with your book. When does your book come out? And I, I, I agreed not to publish it until after the Chad trial is over. Um, okay. I have a verdict or a plea agreement in that trial. So I'm hoping the end of May. Okay. okay. And they'll, it'll probably be available on Amazon for pre-sale, I'm guessing. Yes. Yep. Yep. This uh, Genius Books is the publisher, and it'll be on Amazon. I don't guess. get don't get it printed in Latin. Um, yeah. You might have some issues with the Amazon. Story. The whole story. I don't know anything about it. If you don't mind, as a thank you, Adam, let's send Tom a, a, a book he didn't ask that may not be interested, but let's send Tom a book. Or our audio version's got to come out soon. You may prefer audio to a book. Can we send you one of those? Just say thank you for being on the podcast. Oh, I would love that. I would uh, prefer a book. Okay. Nice. Thank you. We will get it. Here it is right here. All right. And then Rex signed it. Nice. I signed it. It's all ready to go. We'll get it in the mail to you. So if you would, just email your uh, address to us. And I'll do that. And we'll send you we'll send you an autograph book. There you go. I appreciate that. Thank you. All right. Glad to do it. Tom Evans, thank you so much. Money, power, and sex, which is how the prosecution framed it, but that's that's a good title for the book. Um, is your name going to be the author's name, or is it going to be Jury Teeth? Uh, I think somewhere my name will be on there too. I don't I don't know how the the layout the cover's done as far as the uh, illustration goes. It's going to be a picture of Lori, a sketch actually by the sketch artist. Okay. Sitting in trial, the way I saw her most, which was turned to the side with her ha- hair down. Yeah. And then the background is going to be uh, yellow and white stripes. And then it's going to have the title and my name on it. Cool. Oh, not in you know, origin, white, origin white stripes, just like her her uh, prison yeah. garb that she wore. Well, when, you, when, um, when your book comes out, we'll have you on again, and then you can ask us all the other questions that you have. You'll have three months to write down tons of questions. Well, I'm going to do that. I'm going to do that, and then I'll send you guys a copy of my book. Yes, I love it. Look forward to that. Yeah. Well, right. Tom Evans, Jerry, Need, author of Money, Power, and Sex, talking about the Lori Bell uh, trial, of course. Thank you, Tom. Thank you, guys. 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 <laughs>